Oh, then, you know, sure, you could have a berry phase of pi, but you could, you could also have a berry phase which is anything in between zero and pi. And there, there, there'd be no distinction between, between this phase and this phase. Okay, so there's something about polyacetylene that prevents, uh, that, 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 that keeps this well defined. And so let me just um, uh, 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 digress for a minute to talk about the symmetries that, that polyacetylene has, because it has two kind of interesting uh, symmetries. So the first one is actually kind of an artificial symmetry, though it's a, it's a symmetry which is very useful to think about and something that we're going to keep, we're going to come back to um, uh, 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 a few more times uh, later on. And so sometimes this is called a chiral symmetry. It's unlike a usual symmetry. Usually when you have a symmetry, you think that that defines an uh, operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian. This, this chiral symmetry is actually an operator which anti-commutes with the Hamiltonian. So, so the Hamiltonian anti-commutes. So if you have a Ham Hamiltonian which only involves sigma x and sigma y, then it anti-commutes with sigma z. Okay? Now, the reason this comes about in uh, the Sushri-Ferheger model is because this lattice that we're talking about is a bipartite lattice, has an A sublattice and a B sublattice, and the um, uh, and and the only terms that we have in this sushri Heger model are hopping terms which couple the A sublattice to the B sublattice. Okay, so so if you have um, a, a theory like that, bipartite lattice with only A to B hopping, then uh, I can do a gauge transformation which changes the sign of every uh, electron on the B sublattice, and that necessarily changes the sign of the Hamiltonian, because that changes the sign of all of the terms in the Hamiltonian. Okay, and so so that and and, and so that defines this um, this uh, uh, operator which uh, anti-commutes with the Hamiltonian. Now, what this uh, chiral symmetry gives us, though, so first of all, it, it enforces that if, if we enforce this symmetry, then it constrains the z component of d to be zero. And what this means is that actually there's a topological invariant, which is an integer, which is the number of times d wraps around the origin as a function of k. Okay? Um, now, um, uh, it also gives you a particle hole symmetric spectrum. Okay, so, um, so what this means is that uh, if I have some eigenstate with energy E and I apply sigma Z to that eigenstate, I get a new state. And that new state is going to be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian with energy minus E. Okay, and so what this tells you is that the um, eigenstates of this Hamiltonian with the chiral symmetry come in pairs with plus and minus energy. Okay, um, for every state with a uh, with energy E, there's a partner with energy minus E. Yes. So, uh, is this consistent with the, the, the topological classification table? Because I, I, there, I thought for, for one dimension, if you have this spinless program, and then if you have the particle symmetry program to plus one, then you have like a trivial classification. But then there you're showing a Z2 classification. No, it's Z. I it's see, okay, it's then, Z. Then it's, it's the integer winding number. It's Z. Okay, so then, so then, how, but, but then before you were just saying it either this. Well, here, so, so, so in the Sutri for Heger model, um, we have two different winding numbers. I have a winding number of 0 and I have a winding number of 1. Somehow in this model, I don't have the winding number of 2. So, so why is that? Well, just because it isn't there. I mean, look, I could have two of them. I could have two chains, okay, and uh, that could give me a winding, and, and, and I could couple them, in a, uh, couple them together in a way that preserves the um, chiral symmetry. So I keep, I, I'm only, I have two chains, and I'm only allowed to uh, couple um, uh, the A sublattice to the B sublattice. Okay, but if I just tell you that I have one chain. But if you just have, so in this simple model, there's nothing that says that, you ha that a given model has to have all of the topological classes that you could in principle have. This one only, this model only accesses two different topological states. So, okay, so why, why? I mean, what's special about this model? It's too, sim I mean, why, it's too simple. It's too simple. It only has two bands. And it, so, so it's, and, and, uh, and it only has nearest neighbor hopping. So I could I could write down a more complicated model that would have that would have that could have more topological states. So is it the number of bands? 
Well, yeah, or the range of the hopping. I mean, so, so I could write down a, a, a model with n neighbor hopping, which could have n different kinds of topological states, I think. Yeah. Is that precise? Yes. Yeah. So wait, so that the n range hopping would give you a n, z, n, you know, in, in this, for these symmetries in one dimension, you're saying n range hopping would give you a zn classification? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure it's that precise. Yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that's right, that's right. So, so, so and notice, um, so, so what you're probably noticing is that, you know, these two things look the same. They're related by just trans translating by one space. So how could it be that one of them has a winding number, the other one doesn't? Okay, and the reason they look different here is because um, in order to define this band theory, um, so I had to choose a unit cell. Okay, and that unit cell, um, I had to either pair them like this or like this. Okay, and so I chose to pair them like, like this. Okay, and so I defined a unit cell and I defined my block states to be um, a periodic in the, in the Berlin zone. And so those, those facts, um, uh, you know, make these two uh, look different. But you're right, so, so um, uh, uh, if I want to talk about the you know, the difference between these, I have, to, I have to imagine going from this to this somehow. Okay. Then what happens uh, on the joint points? We'll get, well, on a boundary? Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's the important thing, yeah. Um, usually, this is just a clarification, usually when we think of symmetry, we think of the unitary operator. Yes. Um, that's going to commute with the Hamiltonian. Yeah. But we're, this is a slightly different. The slightly different, yeah. Is, Uh, yeah, you may be you may be out of my pay grade here. Um, <laughs> so, so I promise you. Actually, next week, uh, Greg Moore is going to uh, satisfy you. <laughs> yeah. Pa say, so, uh, say that again. Yeah, at the many body level, it doesn't, this, this, this chiral symmetry doesn't make, does, doesn't make sense, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is a property of the one body Hamilton. Yeah. No, but he was saying that the, the operator for the many body Hamiltonian commutes, so then when you write it down the single particle Hamiltonian anti-commute, it turns out that it ends up anti with a single particle Hamilton. I think it's yeah. I'm wondering if you find a sublattice that's something like C that got a map to C B. Uh, something like that. Wouldn't that give you a well-defined many-body situation? In that sense, then this is a unitary approach of a many-body material that can be with super material. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd have to think about that. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not thinking straight. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. So. Um, what I want to, a point I want to make though is that this chiral symmetry is an artificial symmetry. I mean, in the sense that real polyacetylene, you know, the polyacetylene that happens in the real world actually does not have this symmetry. Okay? Because um, in real polyacetylene, there's nothing to keep me from having a hopping term that, you know, hops the A sublattice to the second neighbor, the A sublattice. Okay? Am I almost out of time, Fon? I will. Five minutes? Okay. So I'll. Yeah, I mean, I could keep going forever, but I, I, I won't. So, um, uh, so, uh, so um, uh, but polyacetylene does have a real symmetry, which is um, reflection symmetry. So if I, um, if I reflect about the, uh, the middle of a bond here, um, then that is, a, that is a, a, a real symmetry of polyacetylene. And so the consequence of that um, so now um, uh, the reflection symmetry doesn't prevent dz from being non-zero, okay? But it does give a constraint that relates what d at plus k and d of minus k has to be. 
And so given this constraint, it's not too hard to check that the Berry phase, which is related to this solid angle swept out when I um, uh, uh, go around the Brillouin zone, it can only be either uh, uh, zero or pi. Okay, um, and it's maybe it's not so surprising that the polarization, if you have, um, you know, if you have this reflection symmetry, then the polarization has to go to itself under reflection. So what values could the polarization have? Well, it could have zero because the, pol the, the polarization goes to minus itself. So zero is the same as minus zero. Okay, um, uh, but e over two under reflection goes to minus E over 2. Okay? But the polarization is only defined modulo and integer. So that's still the same. Okay? So, so given that, you can see that there are really only two possible values that the polarization can have that are consistent with um, the reflection symmetry. And so in this case, it really is um, a... Um, so if you impose the reflection symmetry, you really do have a... a there are only two topological classes. Okay, so, um, so there's a difference between thinking about these different kinds of uh, symmetries. Okay, and so, um, okay, let me, this is going to be the last thing I talk about because this, this will this will close thing up. So, so the most important uh, consequence of this uh, topological uh, classification is um, what happens when you have a boundary between um, the two different uh, topological states. And um, so this is something that's very simple to understand in the limit where, um, where I make the strong bonds really strong and the weak bonds really weak. Okay? So when I make the, the, the weak bonds really weak, I can just turn them off completely. So then uh, I just have these pairs of dimers which are going to have two states which split by a huge energy. Okay? Um, and so there's a huge gap everywhere on the left and everywhere on the right, but on the boundary there's a, um, a single state that doesn't talk to anybody. Okay, and so this state is going to be a state at zero energy. Now, you could ask what happens if I now turn up the weak bonds, okay? And there, um, it, it's very useful to think about this particle hole symmetry, okay? Because, you know, this state at zero, this zero mode uh, here is a very special state because remember I told you that every state at positive energy if you have the if you have the chiral symmetry has to have a partner at negative energy well this state at zero is very special because it's its own partner okay so that that can happen if you have a state that's exactly at zero and so what that means is that as I turn up these weak bonds that zero mode can't go anywhere all right, because it always has to be its own partner. If, you know, if it tried to move away from zero, a partner would have to appear out of nowhere, okay? And that, that can't happen continuously, okay? So, um, so, uh, so this zero mode is topologically protected and, um, and remains even um, when I turn up this bond to be almost equal to this bond, okay? So this is a classic problem. So another way one can approach this is by thinking of the opposite limit where the dimerization is very weak. And then, um, and then uh, one can map this to a problem of a one-dimensional uh, 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 sort of Dirac uh, Hamiltonian with a mass term which changes sign across the domain wall. Okay, and so this is a... Um, this is a classic problem which has been sort of discovered and rediscovered many times. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and what one finds is, so it's not hard to solve this. Um, so you can basically solve this uh, for an eigenstate at zero energy. So you're basically looking for a zero eigenvector of this Hamiltonian. And, it's, and that is just a first order equation which is easy to integrate. And so you can write down this wave function for the uh, localized domain wall state um, at zero. Okay, and so if you have a boundary where the where the mass changes, which is what this domain wall is, then you're guaranteed to have a, a eigenstate which is localized at uh, at zero energy. Okay, and it's this uh, um, uh, it's the existence of these sort of topologically protected modes on a boundary, um, which is really sort of the hallmark of the of the sort of topological physics that we're going to be that we're talking about. Okay, so um, uh, I think that uh, my time is up, and this is probably a good place to stop. Yeah, I think uh, this will wait for tomorrow. Okay, all right, so... Uh
Talk tomorrow.